All right, so welcome to Seven Keys to a Successful Coaching Business. My name is Andrew Knightlick. I'm the founder and director of the Center for Executive Coaching. What you see on uh, the screen here is uh, where I live, uh, especially uh, in the past uh, few months. You need a ferry, a car ferry, to get to the island I'm on here on the west coast of Florida. It's called Palm Island. Why is this important? Because I have uh, a pretty successful coaching practice. I coach people all over the world. Just before this very webinar, I was speaking to uh, the leader of a, almost a billion dollar company in Mexico. Uh, and, and, and the point I guess I'm making is that there's a great opportunity now because of Zoom and other online platforms to not just be local, but to establish yourself as a national, international, at least regional expert. Okay, the days of needing to travel to a client to meet face to face and therefore restricting you to a local geography uh, are over. I, I don't think I've had a client for two years within a hundred miles of this island that you have to reach by, uh, by car ferry. And so I want to make that clear. The opportunity is really wonderful uh, for those who succeed uh, in, in, in the business. Okay. So let's go through this. Ask any questions you have through the chat. We're not going to be using the q and I've set the chat so you can ask uh, any questions you might have as we go. Um, so here's the seven keys here. I'm going to take you through each of them. Okay, this is meant to be an educational masterclass. Um, so number one, we have to talk about the psychology of the client and how to position yourself so you're not selling coaching, but you're solving problems. It's really important. 99% of coaches miss this. Number two, how to create a strong marketing message and positioning. Again, if you read the marketing messages of most coaches on their website, they all sound generic, they all sound the same, they're terrible, they're not compelling, and that's no good. Okay, when you join our program, I'll work with you personally to get your marketing message honed and in good shape. Then you have to get visible. There's only four ways that work. They're, lots, uh, they're broad, high-level categories. I'm gonna take you through what those are. Okay, number four, you have to make the time required uh, as with any other business to succeed. Number five, there's a way to sell without selling and it's coaching the client through the buying process. I'm gonna talk briefly about that. We have clinics in our program that teach you how to coach the client to see if there's a fit or not. And this will make you much more effective and efficient in your, in your marketing. Number six, uh, you as a coach need to bake value into everything you do with the client. Okay, other, other coach training programs do not talk enough about value, results, return on investment of your fees. Um, that's where we start. What does value mean for the client? So I'm going to show you how to do that. Number seven, the domino effect. This is a very important concept in any professional service. I want to make sure you understand it and put it to work for you. And then guess what? There's actually a bonus key, and that's the mindset required to be successful if you're going to do this as an external coach, if you're going to start a practice. Okay, so let me take you through each of these. By the way, when I first started my coaching practice, and this was uh, about two decades ago now, I messed up on every single one of these, every single one, for six months, no clients, no results, nothing. And it was only until uh, I started figuring things out that I built traction in my practice, okay? So I'm speaking from experience here. Once I figured out these uh, elements, these keys, um, it didn't take long for me not only to fill up my practice, but to make a lot more than I was making as a pretty successful management consultant at a decent sized firm, okay? So let's jump in. First of all, if you look at how most coaches outside of the Center for Executive Coaching talk about coaching, they're making a massive mistake. They, they sell coaching. Now, you can sell plumbing, you can sell law, you can sell medicine, you could even sell psychology or, or, or therapy. And the reason is because people already know when to call those types of professionals, right? That is, if my sink is clogged, I think plumber right away. But if I just had a bad meeting with somebody or I'm not getting along with my manager or I don't like the culture of my organization, I don't immediately think I'm gonna find a coach and call a coach. It's very important to understand that psychology of the buyer. Coaching is still a new field, it's misunderstood. 
And, and yet a number of coaches, in fact, the vast majority, sell coaching as if it were like plumbing, as if people understood when to call a plumber. And so you get stuff like five reasons you can benefit from a coach, the ROI of coaching, or you get buzzwords like transformation, emotional intelligence, ontology, neuroplasticity, NLP, mindfulness. But that's not how people hire coaches because it doesn't have the same correlation to a problem that, for instance, plumbing, law, doctors have. And so no leader wakes up in the morning saying, I need neuroplasticity. Let me Google a coach who can help me with that. That's ridiculous. That's not how it works. So the key number one is to start positioning yourself as a problem solver or solution provider. You're looking for problems. You're listening for value. Okay, so, you know, my, my second client came to me and said, I can't get my team to do what I want them to do. He was a technology leader, a CEO of a tech company. And that was his complaint. Okay, he didn't say, I want a coach. He talked to me about a problem in very clear language, not the coaching jargon that you sometimes hear coaches talk about. Or, you know, this project is not going to hit its targets. I'm not moving up in my career. We're not going to hit our numbers this quarter and my job is at risk. I'm overwhelmed and tired with too many priorities. I'm worried that I'm not going to succeed in my new role. This is where we as coaches want to start. Most coaches, right? If you get into coaching with the Center for Executive Coaching, we're going to show you how to do this. And you're going to be successful right out of the gate because this works much better than saying, I'm a coach. I graduated from this organization. I specialize in emotional intelligence. Call me. That's not how the psychology of the buyer of coaching services works, okay? So let me stop there. Uh, are there any questions? Put your questions in chat. We'll be using the chat and not the Q&A anytime you have them. But this right here, if you start with this, you're going to be much more likely to succeed. You know, when I first started, I was, hey, I'm your neighborhood smart guy, got an MBA from a top school. I was a consultant. You tell me your problem, I'll solve it. I got zero response, as you can imagine. You're probably laughing hearing this. I'm cringing, as I always do when I share this. But then when I said, all right, I'm going to look for problems. Because when people have a problem, that's when they're open to coaching. All right. Now, one of you is already asking, you know, don't coaches enable clients to solve problems? Yes, of course, that's what coaching is. But if you want to get hired, you need to position yourself. You need to get hired by somebody who has a problem. Nobody's coachable unless they have a big enough problem to hire a coach, just like nobody goes to a doctor unless they feel enough pain. Okay, let's move on to number two. Oh, uh, Mark is saying, this is great. Mark is saying, I don't come from a marketing background. Do you need to be charismatic salesperson to succeed? Do you need to be a charismatic salesperson to succeed? Look at me. No, you do not. Nobody hires me based on my charisma, okay? I'm not the person you'd hire on an airplane. I have trouble smiling, although I'm doing it now. Uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a one on a scale of one to 10 on a bell curve for sociability. So charisma isn't my thing, but what I'm good at is listening, asking great questions, uh, and so on, okay? Number two, the marketing messages. I mean, you go to most coaches' websites, and they are just generic, vanilla, forgettable, awful, even cringeworthy. They, they start with, I, it's all I, 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 I. And, and of course, we are in a narcissistic profession, right? There's quite a few coaches who have a guru complex. They're in the business because it's all about them saving the world. And those aren't the types of folks we look for at the Center for Executive Coaching. I'm looking for people who want to serve, who want to help people be better. So you get websites that are filled with I statements. I am a coach. I have my International Coaching Federation PCC designation. Good for you, you and 20,000 others. I graduated from this school and this coaching program. I specialize in. You know, there's a book by Anthony Parinelli called uh, the, uh, Selling to Vito, where Vito stands for very important top officer. 
And the point he makes is leaders do not care about you one bit. You have to earn the right for them to ask about you. And you have to do that by talking about how you can help, the value you can bring. So on the right, you see a much stronger template for a marketing message. It starts with, I know it's an I statement, but this is what you have to have in your mind first is your positioning. I help X to get Y. So like my first clients came when I figured out that I help nonprofit leaders develop a strategic plan that actually gets executed. And that moved to, I help nonprofit leaders uh, develop a strong board. And then I help nonprofit leaders engage their teams so that they can achieve their mission. Once you have that, you can get a strong headline that tells prospects the primary benefit or benefits you bring. You know, nonprofit leaders come to me when they something. Then you can talk about a problem they care about and it's emotional and logical cost. You see the word I doesn't come in yet. It's, you know, nonprofit executives share in confidence the following issues that they have. And I might list three of them and why it makes them frustrated. Then I can move to, it doesn't have to be this way. When we work together, here's what you'll experience. And then I can t explain why I'm the perfect person to work with them on these problems and provide these benefits. And then I can provide a high value, low risk call to action, like click here to see a series of videos about how to something or other, or click here for a three page executive brief about something or other, or click here for this one page checklist to see if you're going to something or other. The word you in this kind of marketing message shows up two or three times, you referring to the client compared to the word I, which shows up maybe once to every two or three use. And the word I really shouldn't show up much at all until about the middle or end when you feel like you've earned the right to show up. So a good marketing message is like you're telling a story. It's like a good movie. A good movie starts with a hero and the hero has a problem. Well, your hero is the client, not you. And your hero has a problem. You're going to talk about the problem that hooks the person in. That's what's compelling because it's about them. Now they're going to want to watch the movie at some point. They want a resolution. You're going to show them how you can help and why you're the perfect person to do that. Okay. So in many ways, this is the strategic foundation you have. This is your positioning. So if you're just a general leadership coach, you're in trouble. What we teach you to do, should you join the Center for Executive Coaching, and again, I'll work personally with you to do this, is we want to establish you as the go-to professional in your mar market. Okay, so that when people have a need, they think of you first. And again, you have such a wonderful opportunity nowadays because of the way the world is to establish yourself as a national or international expert if you want to do that because of the online nature of our world today. Okay, any questions about this concept? Um, I have to say sometimes you need, you know, what I found is that coaches often need help doing this. They'll send me their marketing message and it looks a lot like everything on the left, even though they've been through what I shared on the right. And so we have to work together a little bit with a little bit of coaching. I can tease it out of you what you're going to be the best in the world at addressing why you and how to really create good copy here. Another one for me was I help technology leaders who are brilliant at technology become brilliant at engaging and inspiring their teams. Okay, so that one worked for me as well as the nonprofit one. So now we're ready for step three. There's four ways, there's only four ways to get visible. I know that there's all sorts of snake oil sales, men and women selling marketing services. Uh, that's because so many coaches are so desperate because they have such a lousy focus because they don't understand this first point that they'll pay people for some sort of silver bullet. There isn't one. There's four ways to get visible. The first is relationships and alliances. If you're an introvert like I am, what you need to do is find five to 10 people who have great network and know you, trust you, understand the value you bring and bring people to you. That's my strategy, right? Over the years, I have five to 10 people who refer a few clients to me 
a year, and that works out brilliantly. You can form alliances. I have an alliance with somebody who uh, does, some, uh, does assessment tools, right? He knows I'm a coach. I know he's an great at assessments. We work together. I've had an alliance with an investment banker slash private equ equity leader. He had a portfolio of companies. He needed someone like me to help the CEOs and executive team uh, improve their teamwork, develop strategy, execute, uh, communicate effectively, especially when presenting to investors. And I became the underground executive coach for him. That was an alliance. Relationships means you're constantly building your power base, letting people in your network know how you can help, asking for introductions, not leads, but just introductions. Who do you, you know, who do you know in this space that you think I should know? Where can I give talks? Educational marketing is what I'm doing right now. Okay, this is where you demonstrate that you're a credible expert. I got my first client this way, actually my first two clients this way. I gave a speech, uh, really a, a mini workshop uh, for a nonprofit support organization. 25 executive directors of nonprofits were there at the end, four came up to me, two ended up hiring me. Educational marketing is writing blogs, giving webinars, speaking in public when that's possible again, writing articles, doing videos, posting them on YouTube, you know, on LinkedIn, writing articles and posting, getting involved with groups and contributing, okay? Educational marketing is a great way to have people get to know you. You see, so many coaches are so stuck in myopic thinking that coaches don't give answers that they blow it. They don't get hired, right? There's a difference between how you present yourself to the market and what happens when a client comes to you when you're coaching. I'm gonna present, my, you know, clients wanna hire experts. I'm not gonna to go to a knee doctor unless I know the knee doctor can help my knee, unless I know the knee doctor is an expert, right? If I thought the knee doctor was gonna say, Andrew, sit up on the table. Now, let me ask you some questions with the hopes that you'll come up with the answer to, 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 to fixing your knee. You know, how do you, what are your ideas to fix your knee? I'd be out of that office so quickly. And for some reason, coaches don't understand that this applies to them as well. Clients wanna know that you know something, that you have a point of view, that you're credible, that you have substance, and for most of you who are joining us today, the people who tend to be attracted to the Center for Executive Coaching, this is a way to do circles around most other coaches who are putting out cliches, generic content, or no content at all because they don't think they have to. The third way to get visible is leadership roles. And here, quant quality matters much more than quantity. So for instance, if you're focusing in on healthcare, specifically healthcare systems, there are a number of associations you should join. And really, you just have to pick one and become a leader in it. Offer to do some research on the members and then present that, your findings. You know, interview some of the members about a problem they have. Present those findings to the members through a webinar and do that as a volunteer. Get on a key committee and start to know people so that, and, and have them get to know you. Or maybe locally, there's a nonprofit where lots of decision makers are, if your market applies. You know, maybe you get on the board of the local symphony. There are some attorneys and some accountants who get all of their clients just by being on the board of directors of a few key associations. So be a leader. Like if you've joined the Chamber of Commerce, don't just show up for those networking meetings. Those are awful. Get on the Economic Development Committee or be an ambassador, be somebody so that people know you and start talking about you. That's number three. Again, I'm an introvert. I've gotten a number of clients though because my wife has been on the board of an organization or two in my town. And she talks to board members and when she hears an issue, she sets up a conversation with them and with me. It's awesome. And then of course there's online marketing. This is the one where you have to watch out for the snake oil salesmen and women. Like I've hired at least three LinkedIn consultants and I would say I've never earned a return on investment, right? I know you're on LinkedIn. You probably get LinkedIn spam from these digital marketing consultants all the time. What I'm talking about here is authentic online marketing. First, a good website that makes you credible. 
And second, and by the way, we have a whole one hour webinar about how to do a proper LinkedIn profile and how to, how to get active on LinkedIn without being obnoxious or spammy. That's in your member area when you join us. But you know, on LinkedIn, it's about make connections online so that you can have conversations offline, build real relationships, show that you're the real deal. Don't post political ads that we see all over LinkedIn now, right after the recent election, everyone celebrating who won or bemoaning who didn't win. Don't post you know, inspirational pictures of cats or those stupid puzzles where you, if you have to squint your eyes. I mean, it's about showing that you're an expert, that you have something to bring, that you have value, right? Online marketing could mean posting videos occasionally to YouTube, having a blog, having a newsletter for sure, where you send out great content, and that's really all. The good news is there's a book by uh, uh, an author named Ford Harding called Rainmakers and then the subsequent sequel, uh, uh, Creating Rainmakers. And he did research on how professionals get clients. And the good news is there's no one size fits all, right? If you join a franchise, watch out because it might not be the right system for you for marketing. Successful professionals find their own way. You know, within each of these four categories, there's plenty of things that can work for your style and your skills. You don't have to do all four. Typically though, you should be casting five nets out there. You know, like in my case, keynote speeches are not my thing, but I like leading, you know, small workshops works very well for me. I get a lot of clients that way. And so for educational marketing, I do some things and not others. Okay, let me stop here. Uh, what questions? Uh, might you have so far? Again, we talked about a marketing message and then of course you have to get visible with it. Uh, referrals is definitely on here. It's part of relationships and alliances. Okay, relationship marketing is referral marketing. But what's interesting today is you can't go to people and say, hey, can I have a referral? It's about, hey, can you make me an introduction to someone you know that might benefit from what I do or who you think I, you know, would be good for me to know? Okay, and by the way, word of mouth is very different. Word of mouth is passive. It doesn't get on this list because word of mouth is something that happens. Okay, I'm talking, when we talk about referrals, I'm talking about proactive conversations with your relationships and alliance partners to, to bring in hopefully a stream of introductions and leads. Uh, Sheila is asking, could I say more about casting five nets? Yeah, I mean, you wanna think about this as fishing, right? And you wanna have, I, I, you know, the metaphor I was using was like five nets out there fishing. So you want to have five tactics that work well for you. You know, maybe you have a particular, you're going to talk to have conversations with 10 people in your network every week. You're going to meet with one alliance partner every couple of weeks. You're going to give one webinar a month, right? You're going to go to one uh, board meeting a month, you know, for the organization that you've chosen to join and be a leader in. You're going to post X number of blogs, you know, if you think blogs will be the thing. And you're always testing. Okay. Next up, you have to make the time required. One of my biggest pet peeves as a coach to coaches is when a coach calls me and says, Andrew, I, I don't have any clients. And I then say, Uh, I then say, you know, show me your book. Where have you been spending your time? And the, and the book is empty, right? Maybe they're watching Judge Judy, The Bachelorette. I don't know. Maybe they're walking their dog, driving to the Starbucks drive through every time they feel stressed. I don't know. I don't know what anyone's doing. But how you spend your time tells you your real priorities. And when you start a business like this, it's like a, it's a business like any other. And you have to be sure you have the financial resources, the time, the runway, and the, the, the mental state to do it. Because the first phase of any business is what's called kickstart. You're essentially putting 10 units of energy in and maybe you'll get one unit out. It's not unlike the pictures of uh, the, the mythological figure Sisyphus pulling that boulder, pushing the boulder up the hill every day, but never quite making it. That's what it feels like every waking hour. You have to spend uh, having conversations about your business, generating interest and awareness, leaving no stone unturned. Momentum 
is when you start getting clients. And, and my recommendation per uh, the question in the uh, chat about a rule of thumb on how many hours a week for biz de dev, look, if you don't have any clients, it's every waking hour. It's like at McDonald's or fast food, they say, if you have time to lean, you have time to clean. Well, if you have time to lean, you have time for business development. But well, you know, once you get clients coming in, you don't want to fill your practice, right? One of the worst mistakes you can make is taking on a giant client, one client, five days a week. That's a job without benefits. And now you're not marketing. Momentum means things are going well. You're spending now two days per week, one to two days per week marketing, and the rest of your time is with clients. Momentum feels like you put a unit in, you get a unit back, you know, sort of like you, you hit a, a hockey puck on an ice rink and it, you know, it keeps going, you have momentum. Or you're rolling that boulder, you're at the top of the hill and it's flat and you're rolling it across the top of the hill. But always leave two days per week. That's what I do. It's not, the same, it's not a straight two days, but as the math works, it's two days. I typically spend one of those days building something, like building a program, writing a book, and one day on pure business development, finding clients. And then there's acceleration. This is the best of all phases. This is, this is when you're kicking, you're kicking it. Okay, it feels like you, you release the boulder, it goes down the hill. But even then, remember, one day per week for marketing, or you're going to run out of clients someday and be back to kickstart. The good news in this economy is for a while, everybody went back to kickstart. And the successful ones are the ones that are doing the work right now to get back into momentum. And I've been delighted with the emails I get from Center for Executive Coaching members. And every day, it seems I'm hearing about new clients that relatively new coaches have acquired, have, have signed up, and it's wonderful to hear. Some pretty big. I mean, one of our members uh, just signed a three-year deal, he tells me, for, um, I think he said, seven figures uh, with a major health system. So most coaches grossly underestimate how much time business development takes. You'll see why in a moment. Part of it has to do with how coaches think about selling. But if, if you think you're doing enough as a coach, you probably have to double it. That's what I found. One of the reasons is a lot of prospective clients won't tell you no when they mean no. They lie. You know, maybe they're polite, but they're actually not being polite because you think they might become a client. They hem and haw. They ask for proposals. They ask for references. They tell you they have to think about it. They tell you to call back in a month. Well, odds are good if a client, a prospective client is doing that, they're really not going to hire you. And so that just means you need more and more business development to find the clients that will. So you have to make the time required. That's the next key. Okay. That's number four. Number five. So the first mistake I made as a coach was I didn't know how to market. That's everything we've covered so far, attracting people to you. The second mistake I made was I thought there was some magic selling approach or formula or skill. If only I knew it, I could convert all of the no's to yeses. And it turns out it, that wasn't true, right? I read the red books, the blue books, all the books about selling. And when I tried those techniques on clients, they didn't work. I came across as a used car salesman. I came across as inauthentic. And, and, what cracks me up is the answer was staring me right in the face. We're coaches. You know, if you become a coach, we're going to teach you the coaching conversations that get clients engaged, that, that get them interested. Well, why not do that with selling? Now, when a prospective client contacts me, I'm going to coach them to find out if there's a fit. I'm detached. I'm not trying to sell them. I'm happy either way. I just want to understand, is there a big enough problem or opportunity for them to hire an outsider like me. So I'm gonna to ask tons of questions about the problem they face and what it's costing them, what a solution means to them, the value they would get. How will they feel when this is done? What's the cost of the problem to you, your organization, your hassle factor, headaches? What's your manager saying about it? What are your employees saying about it? What are the customers saying about it? What does it mean for how you spend your time? What does it mean for uh, the financials of the organization. And then the second question I want to coach them on is whether or not they have the money. You know, if a client seems delightful and has a big problem, but doesn't have the money, you know, I, 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 
I have time when I provide charity work. But if a client doesn't have the money, that means they're not going to be a client in my business, right? I mean, I could go to a Ferrari dealer right now and say, listen, I'd love to buy this $800,000 sports car, but I don't have the money for it. Can I have it anyway? No, of course not, they're going to say. And yet many coaches don't buy into this. But you have to ask the tough questions. You know, how, how do you get the budget for this? Who else besides you is involved in the decision? What is your budget? How big a check can you sign so that we don't have to go in through any approvals? You know, I, I work with a lot of folks who can sign a $20,000 check. So not surprisingly, a lot of my engagements start with a $20,000 engagement, right? Let's just, you here, sign the check. Let's get going. I know I can always keep a client for a long time if I provide value, as you'll see in a minute. So one, do they have a big enough problem or opportunity to make it worthwhile to hire an outside? Same question you ask before you go to a doctor, right? Do I feel enough pain? I have a tooth that's starting to hurt. Doesn't hurt quite enough for me to call the dentist yet. But once it gets there, I'm going to the dentist. Same thing, do they have the money? I need to ask those tough questions. It drives me crazy when a coach calls me and says, Andrew, I had a great conversation with a client. They asked for a proposal, how much should I charge? Well, don't ask me, I'm not signing the check. I'm not signing the proposal. If you didn't talk to the client, you haven't coached them through the buying process. You haven't done your job because you didn't ask how much this is worth and based on what it's worth, how much will they pay? Do they even have the budget? So there's a question in the chat. What about pro bono clients initially? I have found that the worst clients possible are pro bono clients. And the reason that's the case is because they have no commitment. Money is a symbol of commitment. Once people pay, it's amazing how much more likely they are to show up and go through some of the tough questions of uh, being coached. Okay. And then I don't even mention the word coaching. When I coach them through, you know, I don't say I'm a coach, we're going to coach. I might say to them, look, how do you see this working? I always have a simple solution ready to present. And I'll say, look, well, you know, one model might be a coaching model where we meet weekly pretty intensely, you know, have a, have a really nice high impact discussion for an hour a week, start with some assessments. But I'll ask them, sometimes they might say, no, I was thinking maybe you could facilitate a meeting with the executive team and myself to start to solve the problem and then work with me one-on-one. -on -one. So again, I'm even coaching them through the buying process. Uh, when you join the Center for Executive Coaching, we, we introduce you to a three-phased approach so that you can very simply and clearly explain to the client that you have, show the client that you have an efficient, effective path to get them the results they're looking for. And so to uh, uh, Sam's asking in the chat, and I, by the way, I've set the chat so only I can see it today just for, for efficiency of questions. How can you prune the tire kickers before giving them hours of your time? Well, that's exactly what this process does, right? So right up front, if I don't hear a big enough problem, I'll say that. Or if they tell me I've had this problem for five years, I'll say, I'm confused. You know, why do you want to solve it now? And if I don't hear a compelling answer, I'm probably going to say, you know, I, I don't see you paying money for this. If I ask them about the money and they say, I have no idea where I'm going to get the money. We don't have a budget for it. I'm going to say, you know, can you check into that? And maybe we can speak once you do. So I'm firm, but not rude. I want to work with them. I hope they want to work with me. But if, but if they're not qualified, I'm not going to spend hours and hours and hours. Okay, that's the beauty of this approach. And that's why it says this will increase your conversion ratio. You see, conversion ratio is how many people you go after compared to how many people actually hire you. My conversion rate is really high because to get into that ratio, first you have to be qualified. You know, if you don't have a big enough problem or opportunity, if you don't have the money, then I'm gonna end the conversation politely, but quickly politely because I know they might have the money. I, a client I just signed last week talked to me a year ago. In fact, he talked to five coaches, including me, a year ago. I never heard back from him. He called back, you know, and hired me just two weeks ago. And he, you know, I, the reason was something happened in his business, but he, he remembered me. He liked me the best for some reason, and now we're working together. So you want to be polite, but you don't want to waste your time. In fact, way back then, he asked me, 
He said, can you write all this up? Can you summarize our discussion and send it to me? I said, no, no, that, that's not gonna do anything. You know, you tell me, how do you feel about this? You know, how do you feel about moving forward? Um, there's, there's nothing that's gonna be in that paper that you don't already know. And so, you know, I, I'll leave it to you to tell me how you wanna proceed from here. I'm glad I didn't write up all that. I mean, we talked for a long time. Would have wasted my time. So the other part of coaching through the buying process is handling objections brilliantly. You know, if they say, give me three referrals, I don't do that. I'm going to say, look, I, I have a stack of people who will talk really highly about me, but you know, I'm a small organization. I don't want to waste their time. Let's say I give you three referrals and they do speak. They say really good things. What happens next? And I keep quiet. And if the client doesn't tell me they'll hire me, I'll say, you know, it's probably not time to give you referrals then. Let's wait until you're sure you want to hire me pending referrals, and then I'll give them to you if you still want them. 99% of the time, they don't even ask. They say, send me a proposal. I'll say, great, can we spend 20, 20 minutes now? Let's figure out what to put in it. I can't read your mind, and so if you don't mind, I'll ask you some questions, and that's where I'll ask. I'll say, you know, let's confirm scope, let's confirm budget, and then when we're done, I'll say, look, if I send this over to you, what happens next? They better say, I'll sign it and we'll move forward. If they don't, then I know they're not serious. Okay, so that's how I weed people out. I'm super efficient in my conversations about business development, about whether a prospect should become a client. If they don't seem serious, I'm very open for that, with the, about that. Okay, let's keep going. Next, and this is what sets the center, one of the things that sets the center for executive coaching apart. If you wanna be a successful coach, you had better bake value into every conversation. Way too many coaches are just weird. I don't know how else to say it. They're weird, they're narcissistic, they have some sort of philosophy they're evangelizing. They're academic, they're theoretical. They talk and talk and talk. They tell stories about their past. They tell the client what to do as if they're a guru as if the client were the same as them. No, you have to bake value and results in everything you do with a client. So I don't accept a client in, unless, you know, when we do the, uh, the coaching discussion here, one of the questions we're gonna confirm, one of the things we'll confirm is that they're gonna get at least five to 10 times value from my fees and their time. I don't wanna take on anyone who doesn't agree with that. So we create that return on investment together. So now we know what results and value means. Before every session, right at the start, I'm gonna say, what would make this the best hour of your week? There's lots of ways to ask it, but I wanna get in an outcome that's gonna be really productive for the client. And I truly want this to be their best half hour, hour of, of the week. In the middle, I'll check in. I'll say on a scale of one to 10, how are we doing in delivering the value you wanted to achieve today? And if it's not a nine or a 10, I'll say, what do we need to do to make it a 10? At the end of every session, we'll recap. What did you find most valuable? What insights do you have? How are you gonna put those to work? During an engagement, we'll do mid-course check-ins to make sure the value is there. Every single engagement I have, I'm gonna set a clear way to track and measure results. In fact, I, I had a coaching session just before this webinar. We're just at the phase. It's about our third session. We're doing a bunch of assessments now, but I've challenged the client to tell me exactly how he wants to make sure we're tracking and measuring results so that he gets the value he wants. And you need questions that move forward to results and don't waste the client's time. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of coaches out there where the client says, you know, I'm at your office, I need to use the restroom, where is it? And the coach would say, I don't know, where do you think it would be? And you get that kind of dynamic, it's just obnoxious, okay? The questions you ask need to be powerful. And at the same time, you need actual solutions. Let me show you something here. So I'm going back to the website. I hope you can see it. When, when you join our program, your member area looks something like this. And one of the tabs you can click is coaching solutions. So for just about any situation a client faces, you're gonna have a solution for that. For instance, I have strategic planning coaching out right now, but let me just, you know, there's a, a changing a behavior for a disruptive leader, perceptual coaching and the inner game of leadership, communicating simply and powerfully, influencing or high stakes conversations. There's a whole coaching model 
for a client who has to influence somebody. Overcoming overwhelm via time and priority management. There's about 30 of these in your member area. Leadership and executive presence, coaching on the personal domains when that comes up and it will. Improving one's network of relationships, engaging employees, resolving conflict, straight, strengthening relationships up, across, outside, team coaching, coaching to lead change, succession planning. So you could click any of these. I've clicked uh, strategic planning here. And, and you'll see there's a summary of the methodology. In other words, you get a real solution. So you're providing value to clients. You need this to build a successful coaching practice. Uh, there's a, a, an in-depth toolkit. There's usually a, a slide deck in case you're facilitating or training or want an instant speech to give. Uh, for small business coaching, there's a business action plan deck under, um, under strategic planning so that you can lead an annual or quarterly um, uh, planning session. There's a branding deck because sometimes branding and strategy go together. And then you'll see we have about three hours of webinars that are already in your member, member area about this topic. So in other words, when you join, you get a ready-made library of coaching solutions. Just, just to continue, there's succession, planning, mergers, board development, creating a high-performance culture, executing effectively. There's a whole set of solutions about career coaching, business coaching, and creating your own framework as a coach, which is really the um, sort of the, the, the dough that you need to write a book, create a training program, create your own program, become a brand. So that's all there, okay? So let me go back to where I was. I just wanna show you, no other program offers anything like that. Nothing close with the application and practicality of real solutions to real problems that are out there. That's how you bake value into every conversation. You start with great open-ended questions. You start with the International Coaching Federation core competencies of coaching. However, sometimes the client gets stuck. Sometimes you wanna have a more robust conversation well, you're ready to go with these solutions because they tell you the areas of inquiry and conversation and dialogue that typically lead to efficient, effective insights, breakthroughs, results. Okay, so that's number six. Any questions about that before we move to number seven and the bonus? I hope this is helpful to you. I hope you're getting a good sense of what it takes. Um, Mandy's asking, how long does it usually take to build a successful business as an independent executive coach? It's a, it's a bell curve, right? It really depends on you, how well you position yourself, how quickly you either build up a network or outsource your network through people who have a network. That's what I did. It took me six months to get my first client and I made every mistake. I did the opposite of everything <laughs> that I'm sharing with you here. It took me six months to get my first couple of clients and very quickly, those clients led to clients, as you'll see in uh, item number seven, key number seven coming up, the uh, domino effect. Um, we have members who get clients within their first month. Uh, and we get others, it takes them a year or two. I mean, I, I received an email recently from someone said, it's, it's been two years, but I now have a full practice. You know, it, it, the first year was really slow. Yeah, you know, and sometimes life happens. I mean, people have uh, new kids, uh, a spouse changes jobs, you know, they get a new project at work. Okay. Um, here's a question I, I didn't put in under the keys. How do you set pricing? Um, what I'm going to suggest is you do not set pricing by the hour. Charge by the engagement. We have a whole module about pricing uh, in our program and I'll, I'll walk you through it. What's more important than pricing is coaching the client through the buying process here so that you establish they have a big enough problem or a big enough opportunity, there's enough value there that you would you know, have no problem charging the price you charge. That is, you, you, there's, a, there's a return baked in. You see, I come from management consulting, the firm that I was at before I was a coach 20 years ago, uh, you know, the entry point just to get in there was about $150,000. So I have absolutely no problem finding clients where they pay me $20,000, $25,000 for a six month coaching engagement. And, th and that's what I typically charge. Okay, there's coaches that charge a lot more and there's certainly coaches that charge a lot less. Okay, let's keep going. 
So the seventh key is creating the domino effect. So with a lot of coaches, they just don't think strategically. And, and again, this is your opportunity to do circles around them. A lot of coaches are, are on a treadmill. Okay, they're low level coaches, they're life coaches trying to be executive coaches. They really don't have the right to be executive coaches uh, at all. And so what happens is they're one and done. You know, they maybe get a client once and the client never hires them again. And maybe they get a client for a very short term engagement, like a few sessions for a few hundred dollars. It's awful. Don't go into business if that's your model. But that's what so many coaches do because they go to programs that don't teach them the right way to think. Okay, what you wanna do, and this is what happened to me when my practice got going. I had two clients initially, right, from that talk that I gave. I got a third client from a talk I gave down in Silicon Valley to some tech leaders. So I had three clients. I could trace one year later about easily half of my practice from referrals to those from those clients, either other work I did for them in the organization, coaching others, or referrals they gave me to other organizations. So the domino effect means just that. You start with one domino and you know those dominoes that as kids we would put together into patterns and you knock one down, it knocks a lot down. Suddenly your marketing becomes a lot easier when you have a few clients, right? I'm always listening for new ways to help the client. And when I hear those things, I say, look, I don't want to talk to you about it now because, you know, this is a sacred coaching session, but I'd love to have a conversation with you after about this issue you just raised and see if I can help you with that. I also always ask a client after a session, you know, what was most valuable for you? Uh, research on getting referrals shows that the best time to ask for a referral is when there's a, uh, when, when the client is happy when they've gotten value from you. So if the client says, oh, this was a great session, it was amazing, this is what I got out of it, that's an opportunity for me to say, you know, I'd love to, can I buy you a cup of coffee or, you know, nowadays, can, can we have a telephone conversation or a Zoom call? I'd love to pick your brain about who else you know who might find value, whether in your organization or other professionals you know. And that sets up the opportunity to get introductions and referrals. Sometimes I might, just meet with a client and say, hey, can I talk to you about other things I do that might help? And I can talk about facilitation, other types of clients I have, and, and see if there's a need. And finally, the successful coaches I know, myself included, we're not just coaches, right? We take the highest strategic ground. That is, you want to be a strategic advisor, leadership advisor. That way, you could provide executive coaching, you can sometimes offer trainings, you can facilitate, you can be a consultant, you can assess. There's a number of things you could do. Like my business model is I'll typically start coaching a client. At some point, the client will express an issue with their team and that leads to an opportunity for me to do an assessment of the team and even a team retreat. At some point, the client will also complain about either the need to get a strategy done and or somewhere they're stuck that involves their team, like a change initiative isn't moving quickly enough, or they're not executing on some sort of strategic priority. And that leads to strategic facilitation. So in other words, my goal with a client is to become a trusted advisor. Not just a coach. A coach is at the lower level of strategic thinking. You always want to take the highest strategic ground. So key number seven to building a coaching practice, and this really makes it easy, is establish or create client loyalty so that they want to work with you more and so that they talk about you to others, they introduce you to others, they open up new opportunities to others, right? So for me, I don't need a lot of clients to have a six-figure practice, right? I need about five, and I can get up into the $300,000 range based on the average value of a client right? Because a coaching engagement for six months, my coaching engagements are about six months, meeting weekly, but backing off maybe to every other week after a couple of months, that's twenty dollars to $25,000. 80% of my clients will renew for another six months, right? So already expected value there is about forty dollars $45,000. And as I said, I'm almost always hired for one or more facilitated sessions, which can go for, you know, anywhere from fifteen dollars to $40,000. So, you know, a typical client for me in a year is worth about 70, 
So do the math. You know, if you want to make $350,000, that's five clients. Now, I understand, you know, not everyone want, is comfortable charging that amount. I am because of my consulting background and because I started 20 years ago charging a fraction of that. I've raised my prices over the years. Okay, and that's fine. You don't have to pick the perfect price right away. Quick question from Colin. Does my program include how to use assessment tools? Indeed, it does. In fact, let me, let me share to the website here. This is a diversion, but I'm happy to take it. Uh, let me go back to the member area. So under uh, the member area here, if you click, if you were to click our Center for Executive Coaching, you'd see there's a whole area called third-party assessment tools. We cover this in our curriculum. You'll even get to take uh, uh, one of the best assessments that's out there. And we have webinars that go on and on about uh, some of the top assessments that are out there, including sample reports, uh, on and on. Uh, uh, in addition, we show you how to do a proper 360 degree assessment, and we have some proprietary tools of our own. Okay. So again, that's all part of adding value because a lot of coaches don't have a good grasp of how to do that. All right, finally, the bonus is the mindset needed. Okay, this is, if you're gonna start an external practice, a professional practice, it's a business like any others. Uh, there's a lot of talk about resilience. I much prefer the term by Nassim Nicholas Tlaib. He has a number of beautiful books. The Black Swan was his first, very famous for predicting uh, the crisis, uh, the financial crisis of 2007. But he's since writ written a number of beautiful books, one in, in fact called Anti-Fragility. And, and, and when I think about why I was successful, it was because I didn't mind getting knocked down. I took so many no's. And each no I took as an opportunity to learn. And I just, I said, what could I have done better there? And finally, someone just told me, like six months in, I was at a networking meeting with someone I met through someone else. And she said, Andrew, I, I get that you're smart. I get that you want to help, but I don't know why I'd hire you. I just don't get what you stand for. And that, that was it. That, that hit me finally. It took six months, right? And, and finally, I figured out I need to stand for something. I need to go back to key number two here, which is picking a niche, you know, having a positioning that, that, that showed that I could bring value. So, so, you know, another way of looking at this is you have to have the mindset of a scientist. You're learning. Or um, I had a, a friend who, who he talked about it like a plate of cookies. You know, we're, we're going around and offering a plate of cookies. When you offer a plate of cookies at a party or an hors d'oeuvre, an hors d'oeuvre tray at a party and people say, no, you don't say I'm a failure. You don't want to quit. You don't want to give up. You just go to the next person and say, all right, would you like a cookie? Would you like a cookie? Would you like a cookie? You really just have to have that detached mindset. That, again, that's why I can coach a client, a prospective client through the buying process. I'm detached. I hope they want to work with me. I hope it's a good fit. But really what I'm just doing is seeing, you know, I'm detached. If it's not a good fit, I'm going to move on. Why? Because I know I'm putting enough time into my marketing activities to attract more people. And eventually someone's going to want what I have to offer. In other words, it's about unflappability. Um, David Sandler in his uh, really classic book about selling, you can't teach a kid to ride a bike at a seminar. I mean, that was one book I pulled a lot of nuggets out of. Um, talks about separating your role and your identity, right? Yeah, our, our role is coach and business developer. We're running a business, but that's not who we are. In other words, if someone says no, they're not, I'm not going to let them say no to who I am. They're just saying no to my, you know, my role as a coach. Doesn't mean I'm a loser. Doesn't mean I'm a failure. None of that even comes up for me. It's just, okay, okay. Maybe they didn't need a coach. Maybe they did need a coach and I didn't quite handle the conversation properly. What can I learn? How can I be, you know, be helpful? Okay. So that's basically what I have for you today. The seven keys. Let's go back to the seven keys here. And you can see them on the screen. Uh, what, what questions uh, do you have at this time? Um, I'll take any questions you have. For those of you listening to the recording, by the way, uh, again, I hope you'll reach out if, you, uh, if, if you're interested in becoming an executive coach. I mean, you could see I'm in my home office today. I work with great clients from around the world. This profession has given me the flexibility, the income, the fulfillment. I work on amazing issues with amazing people. Uh, it's perfect for me. 
And uh, so many people are, are figuring out that it's a, a wonderful career. So if you're listening to the recording and you have further interest, take a look at our website, check out the programs and, um, uh, and, and reach out if you'd like to have a conversation. I'm gonna stop the recording.